Well, welcome everybody to today's episode. This is our season finale, and I'm super excited because it's a season finale. So that means I don't have to do another one of these for a couple of weeks. With that, we have some exciting conversation pieces for today. Unlike any other leadership program that you've ever been a part of, where you go and you sit and listen to lectures for hours, or you read books about people's made up experiences in their leadership trials, we're actually going to do a reckoning today where I get to ask questions about how effective I've been or not been. And, you know, most people don't do that stuff because that's pretty scary. But I'm going to go out on a limb and say that I've paid the guys that are with us today substantial funds so that it'll work out somewhat to a benefit of some kind. Welcome back. Well, before we get started, we have a couple disclaimers we have to go through, and it's what the lawyers have told us we have to do. In a nutshell, because all three of us are military veterans with the U.S. military, and we're all three employees with the Department of Veterans Affairs, I have some, some legal jargon that I have to go through, some disclaimers. While we may mention in the course of our discussion and, our, and share our experiences that we've had or had training that we've received in any official VA or military capacity, any statements that we make or discussions that we have in this recording, in this video, are solely our own and are not sanctioned, endorsed, or the official positions of the VA or the U.S. military. Additionally, the statements in this video express the ideas and beliefs of those making them and not those of the VA or the U.S. military. Lastly, the VA does not implicitly or expressly endorse Sheva Leadership Advisors, Regent University, or any of my activities or research with said organizations. Not at all. With that, legal jargon's done. Time to jump into this. So everybody that's been paying attention and, and participated in the podcast and the YouTube video series up until now, you know that I've been doing a series of interviews with thought leaders, religious leaders, and government and civic leaders as it pertains to different aspects of leadership and the strategies that they use to have impactful leadership to their work. In my studies and my interviews, I've been applying these methodologies that I've learned throughout all these interviews and the studies that I've done on the direct reports that worked for me, on the friends that I had in the VA and military, and as well as um, both uh, organizations and my family. My kids, you know, they got the tail end of all this stuff, or the brunt of it, actually. Both Mike and Rich, who are here with us today, have worked with me as peers, as mentors, training advisors, and as direct reports at some time. And they're now leading their own teams again, because <laughs> they've all led teams before, but they're leading again now. They've had a distinct misfortune for parts of their careers to know me for several years and have some exciting times, sad times, rough times times of great change, and times of ease with me. So they've seen both the, the best and the worst of what I've done and, and any of the stuff that I've brought to the office from the research that I've done. While they were beneficiaries and witnesses of my sometimes low-budget attempts to implement my research findings throughout the years, these years of study had led me to develop my own sort of uh, methodology. And so... I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and then we'll kick it off with a little overview of what I've discovered and what I've learned in this little methodology that I have. So with that, uh, Mr. Rich Weir, would you take us away and tell us a little bit about yourself? Yes, thank you, Garrett. So we we did meet in about 2000, oh, I don't know, 12, 13. I don't know. It was a long time ago. It was well before COVID. <laughs> oh, yeah. A long <laughs> Um, we, we were co-workers at the, or yeah, peers at that time, I would say. And then, um, you advanced up the leadership chain and I said, uh, oh, I don't know, one or two steps ahead of, ahead of me. And, uh, no one's keeping track of who gets there first. <laughs> it's all about getting there. <laughs> I believe I had a better deal, but you know, Hey, <laughs> 
And then uh, you were my supervisor for, oh, I don't know, what, five, several years, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then I left where you're working at, and I work for a different branch of the VA now. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thank you, sir. Thanks for your time. Mr. Mike, you're next up. Okay. Well, um, I came into the VA back in 2011 when I retired out of the Army and uh, spent 25 years there. And then when I came, met you in like the end of 2011, beginning of 2012, when we uh, merged into the hub. And then, uh, you know, we we're co workers for probably six, seven years there. And then I got an assistant coach job, and you were my first supervisor. Yeah, Sorry about that. No, it was it was great. <laughs> it was, it was a lot from you. You and I were working together for, I think it was close to three years. Just about, yeah. And then I became a supervisor just like you. And no, not like me. Much better. Oh uh, no. Only <laughs> <laughs> applause, but thanks. <laughs> Well, thanks. Thanks, gentlemen. For those of you listening on the podcast version of this, we're talking to Mr. Rich Weir and Mr. Mike Akins, and and they're both from up north, and I'm from down south. I like the warmth, and they apparently like the cold. That's why they're up north. Teach their own. With that, I'm going to try to share my screen. We'll see how well this works in this awesome environment that we're in. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about, for a couple seconds, hopefully seconds, PowerPoint slide, share. Gentlemen, can you see this uh, cool little graphic that come up on the screen? Yes, I can. I can see the graphic. Awesome. Awesome. So for those of you listening, the graphic is a little PowerPoint slide that outlines a methodology. In this methodology that I've come up with, through all the thought leaders that I've done interviews with and everything, I've come up with a very simple methodology for leadership, which I lovingly call caring, learning, and doing. It's, I like simple things, and I tried to get it as simple as I possibly could. And I think there's a little bit more work I can do on it to refine it and actually get it to be something that's of a simple nature. In the first bracket, we have caring. For leaders, leaders have to care about those that they lead. And we, in order to do that, you have to get to know them. In order to get to know them, in several of the discussions that I've had in previous episodes, you've heard about daily tag-ups. You've heard about various options and opportunities that leaders should have to communicate with those that they they lead and those they work with. And in those conversations, we learned very distinct um, requirements, if you will, when it comes to asking clarifying questions, especially when people like to answer the question or if you go in the office and you say, how are you doing today? And they say, OK, it's it's a good point to ask clarifying questions, most especially in a virtually a virtual leadership environment. Then we have the learning stage, which is uh, the caring, learning, and doing part. In the learning part, we talk about finding your personal message through prayer, study, meditation, and coaching. We learned that by talking to Mr. Tony when he talked about how if you learn your life's message, that will help you lead and govern and, and help others find theirs as well. And once you find that purpose, then you'll attract them. We also learned from Mr. Tony how leaders have to ask what they can do better. And we had several of people that we interviewed in previous episodes that talked about that, that leaders need to be able to listen more than they talk. And, and I'm not doing a good job of that right now. So as we listen and learn, we can be able to determine our followers and our coworkers different values and align those with the organization's values. As we do that, we can also learn the different types of learners that those around us are and help funnel them to the things that they can do that will best facilitate their learning and help them move forward. And with all things, we learned from Mr. Dr. McCarroll that we need to give all the people the information that we have at all the time. As long as we do that, then everybody has the information and they can better help leaders make the right decision as we move forward. And then in the doing phase, we have to set clear goals. Miss Diana talked about how they have to be stretch goals, where they have to be something that moves forward and causes people to stretch a little bit, not something in their comfort zone. Once we do that, we can help them build skills and things that are very important to them, because if it's important to them, they'll do a better job at it. 
it will also allow them the opportunity to build those skills in something meaningful and do something meaningful with the skills that they developed. As they do that, it will allow other team members to try new ideas and experiences and match those ideas with their learning style. Additionally, when experiments fail, which they will, we can take that opportunity to reframe the negative into positive and help others overcome and to learn from their mistakes. As they overcome those things, they can learn to overcome them as long as we're not, you know, hammering them with you suck type things. <laughs> we want to make sure that it's reframed in the positive so they can learn and overcome. And then lastly, one of the most striking things that we've talked about in all these episodes is we heard from, we heard from several people about conflict on how conflict necessarily isn't bad in a team setting. Conflict allows for disagreement. And when there's open disagreement, then you have a chance to actually learn a lot of different ways, or as we've lo lovingly called them in our, in our discussions, hidden ideas that are out there for us. All righty. So I'm going to ask a couple questions. First question I'm going to ask, I want both of you guys to just feel free to answer if you want, fight over it. You can arm wrestle if you want. Since it's virtual arm wrestling, we can pull up some graphics if you like. Both of you have had leadership positions in the past, and now you currently fill a leadership position in your, your current positions. And I'm going to be clear with that. I'm going to call them, um, what's the word? What's the word I want to use? Um, official leadership positions. That's the word I want to use because there's, there's unofficial leadership when you're like the smart person on the team or people go to you because they have questions. And then there's that official capacity where you have a job title that you're supposed to get paid more and do less. And it usually goes the other way around where you do more and <laughs> get paid less because you're doing more work. So with that, you've had leadership positions in the past. What made you come back to leadership positions in the VA? Go ahead, Rich, take us away. Um, very, very simple. It became an opportunity to um, serve more in a, in, a, um, in a higher capacity in the sense that um, in previous roles, I generally just serve one-on-one -on -one because I'm a customer one at a time, me to the customer. But now in this leadership role, I can, I can train my nine people that I currently have and um, help them to improve. And so then my, my um, expertise, knowledge, desire, hopefully translates into multiplies by nine if I can get six, succeed in getting them out there and doing good quality work. Mr. Mike, what about you? Well, what made you come back to the leadership world after all that pain and suffering previously? Yeah, that's an interesting, interesting question. When I left the National Guard, you know, I was a, a leader there. I had a horrible boss, uh, and I was just fried. So when I came to the VA, I got a job that wasn't a supervisor job, but I worked with all the supervisors day in and day out in, as the uh, analyst for the, for the section, right? It gave me the break that I needed from being the guy in charge that I needed. And then when the time was right, I was able to get back into a supervisory role officially. And it, you know, it's like what Rich said, I was ready to um, use the skills I had to better the organization and the people in the division to be able to be more productive and, and help more, more veterans. Both of you, well, Mike, you specifically mentioned that you had a horrible supervisor. And I can only imagine, and correct me if I'm wrong, Rich, but you've probably had one or two as well at some point in your journey of working for people somewhere. And, and I know I have. I'm interested to find out, you know, you mentioned that you had a horrible supervisor. What are some things that you learned from that supervisor that benefited you now? Not to do anything he ever did. <laughs> okay. But this guy was unapproachable. If you got on his bad side, he hated you for life. He fostered a hostile work mm. environment uh, with everybody. You couldn't uh, have a conversation with a guy about anything. And ultimately, he ended up getting relieved of his command uh, because of it. But That bad. Yeah, that bad. So 
you know, there wasn't anything good about the guy to bring up, to mimic in your own leadership style. I learned, I, I've said this for years, I've learned most about leadership from the worst leader ever had. I vividly remember, I remember his name too. And Well, don't say it. We don't want him. <laughs> I, and I wouldn't be able to find him if my life depended upon it, you know, kind of thing, nor would I want to. But, mm -hmm. um, you know, like, like Mike's poor leader, he divided the team and that would, you know, tried to pit one one set of people versus another. And I and that made us an incoherent, you know, non-cohesive team, obviously, if he's trying to butt X against Y and, um, you know, and yeah, I've always said I'll never lead. He did. So. Well, good. I mean, that's great. I mean, all of us have had bad leaders and it's good that we can walk away with good things from it instead of just bad feelings. And that's, that's the point of living. And if you can be in the military and walk away with bad leadership and still walk away from it, then that's a plus two. So it's <laughs> that's awesome. Well, thanks, gentlemen. Thanks for sharing that with us. Um, I would say, you know, next question that I'm curious about is what's, what's your most memorable memory of a leader, whether it's positive or negative? I see Mike's about to talk. He's got something coming out. <laughs> you know, I've dealt with a lot of different leaders, right? And, uh, you know, I think one of the things that really stood out for me was actually when you and I got paired up because you were just taking over the team. And then I was coming in as your assistant and you and I sat down and had a conversation about what we both wanted, what direction we wanted to go, how we wanted to do it, um, and just what our overall uh, impressions of the team were at that point in time. And it was interesting to me how uh, open you were for change. I, I, and you supported a lot of the different things that that I wanted to do personally, but also in my views of where the team was at, uh, coming in from the outside. And you took, I, you could have done the, the, you know, the posture of, hey, it's my team, my way of doing it, you know, come in and, and see what's going on. But you took the other option of, hey, you know, this is uh, the direction Mike wants to go. I support uh, some of this. I support, don't support other stuff. But, you know, we came to an understanding of, which way to go forward and you know right out the gate we were we we're a unified team going forward and that really stood out as a positive for me well thanks that's very kind of you thanks for saying that thanks for sharing that <laughs> rich yeah one of the uh, one of the most um memorable leaders i had was very positive leadership was very early in my military days, um, when he saw the leadership capability in myself, I was just junior enlisted guy. I knew I was just be bopping along in life. He determined that I was going to put in for an officer program, and um, he literally forced me to. I mean, didn't put my pencil on the paper, but military terms, he did, and. You know, that set me on my leadership journey, my, my formal leadership journey. Obviously, I've been informal leader, of, you know, much of my life, but through various. But yeah, so by far, I. Uh, and he wasn't, he was my direct, one of my direct supervisors, but he was in the chain of command, too. So um, that's one of the things that makes it memorable is that you don't have to be the CEO of a gazillion dollar company to um, make an impression. It's a good impression. So, so thanks so much for sharing that stuff with us. That's, that adds a little spark to where we're going to go and some of the questions I'm going to have that'll bring us a little bit into a round circle here, if you will. The hard questions are going to start now. So 
if you want to take a break, run, pretend like you drop connection, feel free to do so now. <laughs> Everybody will be fine. They'll move ahead in life just like nothing else has gone on. I'll start the, the, the question, if you will, with the preface of since we all worked for the VA and that's where we've experienced each other. Um, the VA is known for, and the government in general, and pretty much just any business for that matter, changes the norm. And I think everybody could probably agree with that no matter where they work, changes the norm. And one of the things that I've found that people don't like <laughs> is change. And with it being the norm, people tend to, at least you get the perception, they don't like anything that's happening because <laughs> it's always change. And with that, what are some, some positive and or negative examples where there's been change and the change fell flat or surprisingly went well? I can, I can speak to um, uh, reasonable would be um, bringing you hire the wrong people for the for the position. Uh, you know, you come in, you hire person thinking, you know, they look good on paper, that it looks like it matches up perfectly with the, the job description that we work so hard to detail out. And I'm sure the employee work that works so hard to make sure resume look and then hire the person and then um, it can be quite a downer when that, that person comes on board. Mike, what about you? What's some time that you saw change that was positive or negative? Well, I mean, there's plenty of examples of both, you know, for like the, the whole VA side when we moved from one computer program to another computer program, and it's taking you backwards about 10 steps because of how uh, – you know, not ready to program is that's a negative, right? When it affects being able to do their job. Um, you know, some of the other stuff with just change in general is we've all had people on our teams that deal differently with change. And it's hard to get it to work right for everybody because some people would like you to be really transparent. And other people don't want to hear it until it's official. And they don't want to worry about all the, the what ifs. And you can't do both in a group setting and make everybody happy. So that could be a negative there as far as, you know, you're trying to be proactive. You're trying to tell them about the changes, get them ready for the changes. And then, you know, when the rubber hits the road, they're, they're ready. But others are fritzing out for eight months until it happens. And you, you got to have some balance there. That's true. That's true. I couldn't help. I'm smiling and I see Rich is smiling too. So we have, we can relate to what you're saying. And so that's good. I like the part you pointed out that it's difficult to, to try to manage all those levels of fear that people exhibit when change is coming in a group setting how that you could probably better do it. You can do a better job of it in an individual setting. And part of being a good leader is to find out where your people fall on that spectrum of how much information they want and when, and then right, but help them out with that. True. And even with that, I mean, uh, you try and utilize the position you have to improve the, the policies uh, that are in place to help other people uh, down the road. Right. Like, for example, there was a time where supervisors were only hired in house. They weren't out based. And the people that are, were in the leadership positions were able to work to get that changed. And then, oh, what happens? We get hit with COVID. Everybody's out based and we work just fine without based supervisors. So it was, you know, you get. You do what you can to help the process improve for everybody. And it's funny, though, to fight the teleworking issue, and then all of a sudden everybody has to telework for two years. So <laughs> That was a change for a lot of people. There were a lot of people that were stressed out about that, and there were others that were like, it's not a change for me. Right. I'm already doing it. Our division has been doing it for years, I mean, since mm -hmm. 2011. 
the rest of the, of the building, you know, nobody was doing it. And all of a sudden they had to, and they didn't know how to work in that environment. We did. So. And they leveraged your intelligence and expertise to help them learn how to do it, right? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> <laughs> Of course they did, because everybody that's a leader always asks for people to help out and for ideas. <laughs> so why would they not? Awesome. So earlier when I was talking about, I, I shared a little bit about the methodology, caring, learning, and doing. And so I'd like to focus on the caring aspect for a few next few questions that we got here. If you don't mind, I think we could probably bring up some things there. So in the caring aspect, one of the ways you can get to know people that work with you and for you is to talk to them every day and have little small talk conversations without always just hitting them up for, hey, I need you to, where's this TPS report type deal? Uh, we can you can hit people up about small talk and family stuff. So in where you've worked and things you've seen me do, if that's even possible, have you seen good examples of that or bad examples and what was the outcome if you saw those things happening? Well, I have the good fortune right now of leading a team where where we we are in person five days a week. So um, um, one of my teams is virtual and one of them is in person. So I have the easy the easiness, if you will, of being able to walk around every hour and say hi when. Um, Help them help them out when they're down and um, celebrate with them in person when when we win. So so the caring for face to for those teammates um, is much easier than the ones, uh, but it, it's important virtual ones. And I'll, I'll give you kudos. I and I know for a fact that. You you check in on or you used to at least used to check in on used to. <laughs> well, I, I I haven't worked directly for you for six months, so you know. But uh, you know, checking in on me may be different than checking in on another employee. Um, you know, you may check in on me weekly, but may but another employee may need it daily. On um points in their lives you know if if we're going through a rough patch personally maybe we need built up a little bit and you and in my experience you knew when um, those times were could spread out the check-ins and when they needed to be more that's a good point i like what you brought up and first i'll just say thanks for sharing that and then i'll say i really like that you brought up the part about knowing the communication uh we'll call it the cadence the communication cadence as it pertains to the individuals, not necessarily the team as a whole, but to know the individuals cadence, their desire for that communication cadence. Um, Cause that I know for me personally, if I don't like to be bothered by the boss or talk to maybe an occasional high um, little chit chat here and there. But if I, if I have a problem, I know I can go to the boss and, and usually the boss knows before I do that I have a problem, which is very intuitive on her part, <laughs> but she does a good job of that. How about you, Mike? Well, you know, I think that what you just said there uh, with the boss is pretty interesting to talk about too, because you don't have her do your job by asking her how to do all of your stuff. You do the job, right? You don't ask her if, for all the stuff. So when you do go to her, she knows that it's relevant. Where there's other people that we talk to don't want to make the decisions and always go to her to make the decisions that we're paid to do. So, you know, there is that. But one of the things that I learned uh, watching you was you would reach out and talk to folks. You'd ask them those other questions during their monthly feedback sessions or whatever about, hey, how's things going in your life? How's everything else going? What else can we do to help you? Um, and the, either with the job or, you know, what are your career goals? What do you want to do? How can we get you set up to succeed in, in getting a job in that area if that's where you want to go? And you took the time to care about the 
employees that were under you to help them succeed in this job or their next job. And that's, that was great to see. Hey, one of the things he also showed me or was, you know, not everybody responds the same way or wants the same type of praise, right? You could give out a contribution award all day long and it won't mean anything to them, but you call it a person and tell them, thanks for doing a good job today on this project. That'll get you, you know, kudos for, and more so than, than some other praise because each person responds differently to different uh, stimuli, I guess. So that's a good takeaway. Well, thanks. Thanks. That means a lot. It's been great to get to know several members of the team because they've come out and told me, you know, I don't really like, uh, I don't care about a pay raise. I would rather have days off. And, and I think that's pretty much most people would probably agree with that one anyway. <laughs> That'll say, I don't want the day off because I have to make up the work later. <laughs> that's the other part too. When you're on a production employment, well, you still got to make it up. And when you're not on production, you still have to make it up. From a learning aspect, what are some examples of leaders that, that facilitated learning in the manner that you preferred or that you saw others prefer, and how did that help them? Well, I had some leaders in the past with the military where uh, you learned more by watching how they did their job, how they conducted business, as opposed to reading it out of the book. Or, you know, it was more authentic because what they said they did as opposed to they say one thing and do something else. That's that's a good point. Hypocrisy is a great teacher either way. And, and along those lines, man, uh, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words, but a, a PowerPoint slide, man, can put somebody to sleep in no time. <laughs> you know, I, I can read all about leadership on the PowerPoint, the, all, the, all the core values and whatever organization. Define them however you want, but until you get out on the floor of whatever office you're in and seeing how the leaders are interacting, are they caring for the people actually caring for them? You know, are they, yeah, that means so much more. You learn so much more about people. So. Well, even that's true, individual that's leadership, point. right? Your own leadership. Sometimes you have to be put in those positions where you're out on the floor doing the leadership's role. And then getting some positive or negative feedback of how you're doing to learn from, because you learn mm -hmm. by doing uh, more so than than reading about it. You have to have that mm -hmm. feedback back to tell you if you're doing it well or not. Awesome. So, so you mentioned about feedback, especially for the leader. They need feedback to know what they're doing. Uh, Mike, what's a way that you like to get feedback? Directly. I mean, if I'm screwing up, tell me. <laughs> Tell me what you're doing, what you're doing, or what you know how I could have handled something better next time, um, as opposed to just letting it slide and think I'm just going to learn and do it better next time without being told. Rich, you're smiling and nodding. So I, I ask, I ask to be hit by a two by four. Please don't whisper because or kind of um, simu insinuated or make me guess. Please just hit me with it because that's the only way, you know, I'm not an investigator or anything like that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, yeah. Be clear. clear no. Thanks so much. So far we've had a pretty good conversation about some of the items that we've talked about earlier and you've covered a lot of things that we probably could have skipped all the other nine episodes and just talked to you <laughs> gents and <laughs> been able to just do this. Not that anybody listening, I want you to skip the other nine episodes. With that, I would like some personal feedback from you. You've had the opportunity to see how horrible of a person I am, both in and out of the job, and see how people react in bad situations. So this isn't going to be a praise me. I want to find out what's something that you've seen that I've done in the past that I need or I could do better? No, it's nothing that, that's, you know, bad. I mean, you and I have, were in team meetings where we're trying to portray a thought pattern that gets derailed, 
and then everybody gets in a you know lock brain of not listening to what the actual issue is, and then you know it kind of spirals, and then afterwards you know you and I sit down and have a conversation about what happened, and then you know we realize what the actual issue was that was being brought up that we didn't handle at the time so we could go back and address it afterwards when everybody was, you know, cooled down and thinking more rationally. But that happens to everybody. I mean, it isn't a, a huge criticism by any means. It's sometimes we get wrapped up in the moment and it takes a while to, you know, pull back, reset, and and then uh, adjust. And I'm going to add, just add along that point. And part of it deals with the the specific business line that um, w we as a team were in. Because we realized that we had, um, as being part of a, a quality control, um, people, we had to grow thick skins. Sometimes some people on the team didn't have thick and um um and sometimes people thought we were picking on him or you know um and I, you you never had an easy spot in there so you know i will i won't criticize criticize you for those <laughs> it's a, it's tough thanks so much for sharing that that's i appreciate honesty and it's hard to get sometimes. So so thanks for that. Thanks so much. You know, one of the things that I thought is a positive for you, right, is you saw how you were treated as the assistant on the team. And when I became your assistant or with your current assistant, I think you have provided a better opportunity for us to be leaders and learn how to be effective leaders because of the, the style and format that you've set up for the team. Would you mind elaborating on that a little bit? And this, how did this style and format that was set up, how did that help? I, when I came to you, I basically said, look, I want to learn everything there is to be a supervisor. I wanted mm -hmm. to know all the programs, all the processes. I wanted to do all the the feedbacks with employees. I wanted to lead the employees. I didn't just want to be shelved into one function. I wanted to be a well-rounded leader. So when it was my opportunity to become that leader, I was set up for success. And you provided that type of an atmosphere for me. We always talked on the phone during the week. You always helped me with questions I had about how do you handle this situation or that situation, or what would you do here or there? So I was able to, to piggyback on your years of experience of how to do it with the people that were on the team to be a better manager of, of the people on the team while I was there. But you also helped me grow as a leader by letting me go to my potential instead of limiting what I was able to do. Awesome. Thanks. As we wrap up, I just got one more question for you guys. The question would be, if you had one piece of, of advice that you could give a brand new leader, what would it be? Take her to people that are, that work for you. D try and do what's right for them at the same time, meeting the requirements that are put on you for the position you're in. I, I'll give, I'll give a piece of advice that one of my leaders gave me because um you, you, hopefully you make a right decision. If you make a wrong decision, oftentimes you can fix that decision, but indecision will will kill a team. So um, it, when everybody's sitting around wondering what to do, um, that, that'll kill a team. So my piece of advice would be make a decision. Well, thank you so much, gentlemen, for your time. Thanks for your help today. I think the – I know – I've got a lot of stuff that I'm going to take down and put in a report and hopefully those listening and watching got some really good information out of it too. And just didn't sleep through this, which um, I'll probably play some non-soothing music underlying while we're talking when I do the recording on the end. 
<laughs> Thanks so much for your time. I don't know about you, but I had fun talking and catching up with Mike and Rich. The discussion was both fun and educational for me. In our season finale, we found out that the caring, learning, and doing method works, and it helps followers get more engaged, lower anxiety, and creates an atmosphere where all can learn and grow for their future development. It was great to hear that both Mike and Rich noticed that we used a lot of the things, the tips and tricks that we learned in previous episodes, and that the outcomes were very positive. As a leader, it's good to hear the things you do right, and it's also good to hear the things that you can improve on. As we wrap up our exciting season finale, oh my goodness, it's so fast, but the good news is, we did find a, a, a mother load of small and simple things that leaders can do to maximize impact on those that they lead and the projects they oversee. All of these ideas culminated in the birth of the caring, learning, and doing leadership methodology. And we learned that the methodology works from firsthand experience. I am excited to see where this road leads and what we learn as we refine this process for the future. If you found as many treasures as I did, on this excursion, please join me next season as I continue the hunt for leadership treasures. 